thanks for joining our stream. We're just going to be uh, waiting just for a couple of people to jump on with us and um, we'll just quickly share our stream on our few Facebook pages. So uh, yeah, just sit back. We'll be starting in approximately a minute time. So uh, feel free to share this as well, as well with your friends. And if you have any comments that you'd like to leave us or any questions throughout our live stream, don't forget to put it in our comments section um, and we can uh, answer those questions live for you right now. So thanks for your patience, we'll be with you in a second. video today we do a, um, a bit of a demo on how we make our bacon and ham um, up here we do it all in store so we've got a um, we've got a fairly small pig today this is um, this is from our organic pork supplier uh, who are out in Moringa which is just over on the way to 2J uh, probably 25 k's from the shop um, they're, a, they're a family a family company called Tuntikium um, and they create they they grow these little um, Berkshire pigs for us. This is a little bit smaller than what we normally use for bacon and ham. Obviously, we want a decent size leg for the leg hams. Um, they didn't have they didn't have the larger ones ready for us at the moment. Um, with the cooler weather, we find that the growth rates tend to drop a little bit um, as the pigs burn up more calories to keep themselves warm. All right. So when now with the spring weather coming on. We'll get, they'll get that growth spurt that'll come through and our pigs will be back to, back to a bit bigger size. So what we generally use in the shop are pigs between 45 and 55 kilos. You can see on this one, this one's only 34.6. So it is a bit smaller than what we normally do, but the process is all the same, so we'll, um, we'll take you through that. So what we need to do when we, um, when we make bacon and ham, we get the pigs in, in the carcass form, as you can see, um, and then we need to, to uh, do a process called curing. All right, now to cure the hams, what we need to do uh, is inject them with salt water. So if we just come over here, and this is, this is our salt water, we call that brine, okay? So what we do in the shop, the only ingredients, this is our nitrate-free brine, okay? No sugar, no preservatives, no chemicals at all. The only ingredients in that is salt, water, and fresh rosemary that I grow at home that is totally spray-free, okay? And we use, a little instrument and I'll this one here okay so that's called a salinometer and what that does it measures the density of the water so the more salt we put in there the higher this reading will be up and sitting up like that okay the less salt the lower it gets okay so we do our brines at around about between 27 and 30 a reading of 27 and 30 on the salinometer okay so you can see that there sitting just on just on the 30 mark okay so what we need to do when we make our brines up 
we make them up a couple of days in advance and then leave them in the cool room. Okay, we only use cold water to dissolve the brine and then we, we crush the rosemary up and the, the rosemary's got a naturally occurring preservative in it. Okay, so no chemical, it's, it's just all natural. Um, and then that, you can see you can see in that brine the colour of it, if it was just salt and water it would just be clear. But the brine, the, the rosemary has released its, its juices in there and then that's how we um, that's how we use it to give us some sort of preserving agent in there without the chemicals. All right, so I'll just pop this away because I don't want to break this, they're quite expensive. Hey, Raphael. Mr. Ramirez, is it? It's, uh, it is Mr. Yes, it is. I thought he'd be on the golf course today. <laughs> okay. So I'm sure what? you wish you were on the golf course today as well, guys. Yeah. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. <laughs> a little bit. Okay, so we're going to break down this pig. So what we've got here, we've got a little dip that sits at the end of the, um, at the bottom of the rump where it goes onto the loin. So this is the, this is the leg, this is the loin, and these are the shoulders. Okay? So I'll just use my knife and find the joint in there and mark this straight across. Okay? So I've opened up, I've hit that joint in the backbone. Take the, this is what we call the trunk, and I'll just use the saw and separate the shoulders from the loin. process in the shop called arterial pumping okay and to the best of on best of my knowledge we're the only ones in WA that, that do this and what this allows us to do is not need to have the products in the brine for an extended period of time okay so once we pump them without without curing brine here they then go into the pool room and they continue to soak all right generally with um, with the larger legs of pork um, most places would be soaking them between sort of 10 and 14 days. The, the process that we use, with, which is the arterial pumping, um, we can get them out, in and out of the brine from being from coming in in the carcass form to then going into our smokehouse within about six days. All right, so it does shorten that process up quite a fair bit without compromising the, the quality of the, of the ham. Um, and I'll explain how that works down the track. So, some guys also make a shoulder hand. All right, so if you have a look, if we can just zoom in on here, we'll pick up a little round hole. Just down in here. Okay, so you can see that little hole there? That's one of the, that's one of the arteries. So I'll just use a boning hook and get that. They can be a little bit fiddly at times. We've got Heather and Greg Newell jumping on with us. Hey guys. Okay, so there, there it is there. You can see that little bit of blood in there. All right, so if I move that, you can see that blood moving around. So if we were going to make a shoulder ham, this would be where we'd inject our brine in. 
okay? So there you go, got him. So that's an artery. All right, and so what we do if we're gonna make a shoulder ham, we just use our knife and put a little nick in that so we can then stick our brine needle down in there, okay? Now what that does, by doing this arterial pumping, what it does, it takes the brine, the salt water, to every part of the, the shoulder or the leg that has oxygen supplied to it, okay? Which is every muscle, because oxygen is the fuel that lets the muscles work, obviously. Um, if we go, when we go into the arteries, on the return cycle for the blood to go back to the heart to get oxygenated again, um, it goes back through a vein, all right? And by doing this arterial pumping, what we do is we flush out any residual blood that's left back in the system, okay, in the circulatory system. So it gives us a nice clean product. Obviously, blood contains bacteria, okay, and bacteria is our enemy because bacteria causes spoilage. So the more blood that we can get out, the better off we are, all right? So if we were going to do a shoulder ham, that's how we'd arterial pump it. Sorry guys, our, um, our little tool we use for film is deciding to shake on us. Not exactly sure why, but hopefully the image isn't too bad for you to see. We're all good? Okay. I think it's shaking because it's been held by an eagle supporter and they're very <laughs> nervous about what's going to happen this coming Saturday. <sighs> okay, so this is our loin, alright? I'm going to bone this one out and we'll pump this one. So what I do is just follow that down along the backbone there and I remove the tenderloin, okay? The pork fillet. So I just follow that along there. Okay, so that's our pork fillet. We don't leave the fillets in when we pump them obviously because we can sell pork fillets as a separate product. But we do need to clean that up a little bit. And that's a very small version of a pork fillet. Take this piece of skirt out. Now the skirt holds the stomach and intestines in place. And I just lay my knife down on, my, on the side there and I run down along this edge. Okay, and you can see along here I've got all these little cartilages. This is all cartilage along there. Now I can take that out in, in a piece before I bone it by just following this down along there. Okay, so I've separated the cartilage from the rib and then I just follow this back up. Okay, so there's the, the cartilage. Now I need to remove these ribs and along the backbone. So what I do, I turn the loin over and then just run my knife along the backbone. Then I come from this side. Obviously I want to take as much, leave as much meat on the loin as I can. and that sort of thing is imported from um, Canada or Denmark. It's generally male pigs, okay? So the mature male pigs um, end up having a process that happens with them. It's called boar taint, all right? And it's the, it's the really musty smell um, that you'll get, especially with bacon and ham when it's cooked. Um, when you open it up out of those vacuum sealed bags, you get that really strong musty smell, and that's the testosterone in the pigs, okay? So it creates this, this issue that they have, it's called boar taint. Um, 
yeah, not the nicest thing. We only get the female pigs here. Um, again, no boar tank with no testosterone or minimal testosterone in the system. Okay? Uh, Gaz, do you mind just giving us two seconds? We've just got a little technical difficulty with uh this tripod thing, it'll take us 30 seconds, we'll still stay live, yep. but just letting everyone know that the uh, image might go a little bit crazy for two seconds, but okay. just I want to get this right for you. So what we need to do with this loin, this is what we call the loin. Um, so what we need to do is just trim a little bit of this fat off the edge there. Okay, we can get some usable product out of this. So we'll, we'll just run the, the skin off the edge of the fat. All right, and we can, we can mix this trim and stuff in with our sausages. So what we do with our, with our nitrate free bacon, uh, we do it as what we call a shortcut loin. All right, so we do, we take the belly, this is the belly part, so the, the belly ribs. Okay, so we, we take the belly off in a piece like that, and we do that as our short, as our nitrate free bacon. And this part here we use for either speck, which is left in a piece, just cut in a piece, or streaky bacon, which is sliced up. Okay, so the streaky bacon is the sliced up belly once it's been cooked and cured. All right, so that's that bit done. We're ready to pump that one now. The next one I'll show you is the legs, okay? So what we do with the legs, we'll just split these legs down the centre, okay? Now I'll get my knife on the inside of the backbone there and put it on a little bit of an end, angle and go underneath the fillet. So that's the end of that tenderloin that, that attaches up here at the leg end, okay? And then I'll get my knife flat and give it a push and then mark it down the backbone. Okay. Hi Chelsea, thanks for joining us. This part here on the loin too, this is the American ribs. Okay, not to be confused with the belly ribs that come off the belly part, but they're the American ribs. Okay. Alright, so I've got the leg off. I take the trotter off by just marking around the top there and giving it a push and I can pop that ankle joint open. our trotter and again we've got a bit of trimming that we need to do here we've got the end of the skirt there there's a little bit of a build up of fat down along the edge there obviously we don't want to put that in our ham so we trim this up now because there's no point trimming it up after it's been pumped because then we've got to throw it in the bin but we can we can lean this up and get a bit of trim off that for pork mince or for some meatballs or whatever we need to use we've got Michael James saying hello all the way from Brisbane g'day Michael James Alright, now, this is the important part. You can see down the end down here we've got a, a vein coming back this way and an artery on, the, on there. So when we do this we always take the one that's closest to the outside part of the leg. Okay, not the internal part of the leg. Alright, this, this bone here is called the H bone. And if you watch the video that, that we did previously when, um, when I broke up the side of beef, this is the top side muscle, okay? And for anyone that uh, wonders where you, that you can see our uh, previous live videos, they are on our Facebook page. Um, but you can also find um, our live streams, plus some other videos that we do on our YouTube channel, uh, which is just 
under the Naked Butcher. So if you just pop that into uh, YouTube, it should come up as uh, your first search results. Okay, so if you see, you see these little dark bits here, these are actually lymph glands. All right, what lymph glands do is filter the blood. All right, so we need to remove those. And if I just go really lightly on the outside of that, I'm not even cutting, I'm more, more just rolling it off. All right, so we get rid of those, and then we've exposed the end of this vein, or this artery. So, using a boning hook, I just get down in there. Just need to be really gentle with these, because if you damage, you only get one chance with them, really. Okay. So what would happen, so if you were to accidentally damage it, how, where would, how would you, where would you go from there? I try and retrieve it a little bit higher up, but because, because this pit has been protected with this lymph gland and a little bit of fat over there, the, the artery is a lot more pliable. Right. Okay, and if you have a look up here, it's a bit drier. Okay. So it does get a little bit difficult to get there. Yeah. If not, and you totally lose that vein, which sometimes happens when it comes from the abattoir, um, if they've been a bit rough removing the intestines and stuff like that, they'll, they'll cut that. Right. All right. And I'll show you a different option that we can do to pump them. So what we do now, we just get that and we put a little nick in there, same as what we did before. Okay, so you can see that I've put that there. There's a little cut in there. Okay. The other thing I always do, we've got this artery going up this way and we've got this vein coming down that way. I wanna actually open up that vein. Okay, just by cutting into it. Right, now we're ready to pump. Chelsea Ferguson saying, hey Uncle Gary, you legend. G'day Chelsea. And uh, we've also got Mel Harris joining us. Hey Mel. Hey Mel, how you doing? Okay, this is our bike pump that we have down there. Okay, it's got a pickup hose that comes in there and it's got an outlet hose where the brine comes out this end. I've got two different needles. Okay, we've got our single outlet needle. These ones you can't buy, I had to get these custom made. All right, because no, no one's doing arterial pumping anymore. All right, this is what we call a multi-point injection needle. Just a little bit bigger? It is, it's a lot longer, because so you can do, um, like the bigger, when you do corn silverside, the larger muscles and stuff like that. But if you have a look, I'm not sure if you can see it, but if you have a look on there, you can see the little holes in it. Yeah. Okay, so there's five going down there, and another five going down there. So that's got 20 holes in it, that one. So, if you do damage the vein or anything on there, it's not the end of the world. So, as long as you've got one of these, you can actually jam these in and do the multi point injection. The downside of it is you will not flush out any residual blood that's left in the leg. Okay, it'll only get brine in there, which, which is fine. Um, I just choose to do it that way because the turnaround time is quicker and I find we get a cleaner product. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, hey, Holly, thanks for joining us. What we do now, we put our, our needle on the end of our brine pump. This might get a little bit noisy, but it's, it's okay. It's not, it's not really, really noisy. No worries. Okay, so I've already given this a flush out today. All right, so it's got brine already going through it. And you can see the amount of pressure that that's gonna push that brine into that leg. Okay. Now, we come over here and we pick up this little vein that we've, we've already opened up. I just need to put this over the top there because where I've separated these two muscles, there's a lot of little holes where the blood actually goes between the two muscles, all right, and a brine will come out of there. So I'll just use a little bit of paper on there, alcohol and paper. And then I'll get my needle down in in the end of this artery. All right. Oops. Oops. <laughs> that artery's been damaged, so I can put the needle up a little bit further. And you can see at the top of the leg there where the brine's coming out of the leg. All right, so we know we've got flow through there. Okay, and you can see now the blood starting to come out of that leg from that other part of the artery, the, the vein coming back. 
All right, so if we had have done this with the multi-point needle, we wouldn't have flushed that blood out. Right. You can see a lot of the blood coming from the other side of it. Yeah, coming out of here. Yeah. Okay. You can see that colour of the blood now is starting to... Um, starting to become a bit clearer yeah. as time goes on. Michael Cafe joining us. Hi Michael, thank you for joining us. Okay. You can see how much that's expanded there now. That muscle's really hard. Yeah. Okay. So that one there, pretty much ready to go. We did end up with a little bit of a build up of brine on the outside of the leg here, so we'll just knock that off. Okay, so that's all pumped up. That muscle's really firm now. The only other places I'll need to turn this needle on to get back into is in this end of the hock, all right, and a little bit down here in the knee joint. This is the knee joint. All right, so I'll jam my needle back up in there, a little bit in the fillet, okay, and then a little bit um, up underneath the rump bone. Okay, so I've just got down in that knee bone there, and then a little bit there in the hock. Okay, so that's our leg all pumped, ready to go back in the brine and soak. What we'll do with these smaller legs, we need some, we need some nitrate free handmade in the shop. Um, so we'll leave these soak in there for about five or six days. Probably next, next Saturday, we'll put these in the smokehouse. Um, so we'll leave them sit in there on the bone um, and then bone them and roll them and, and cook them in the smokehouse. Okay. Nick, you've only just joined us. Don't forget that you can always leave us a comment in the comment section if you have any questions. Um, Gary is more than happy to answer them for you live right now. So let's yep, and if, if you do find that you have sort of a question after our live stream is actually ended, you can still leave us a comment because we, um, we, we do regularly check it afterwards as well, so we're always happy to answer your questions. Okay, now with our loin, what we do is we do not pump the belly section of our loin. Okay, the only part we want to pump is along this eye. All right, the reason being is because you've got quite a few seams, okay, like that, and like that, and if we, we inject that with salt water, we end up with a buildup of this brine in the tissue. Right. All right, and you end up with that big watery glump in, uh, glump glump. in the middle of it. Glump. <laughs> glump. I, I know what I'm trying to say. Blob. <laughs> Probably blob. Uh, we end up with that in the middle of it. Okay, and that's that's no good for us. So, that's all we need to do now is pump this along the eye. The salt from the soaking brine that we have in the fridge will absorb into the rest of the muscle while it's sitting in the, in the cool room. Okay, so I'll just give this a squirt and you can see the difference. Actually, I'll do it over here. You can see the amount of brine that comes out of this one. Alright, All right, so that's our multi-point injection. really need to do with our with our loins for our bacon. Alright? That'll go in there, it'll soak, 
these, the, the loins don't, obviously because of the density of the meat, they don't take as much uh, time to cure inside as what the legs do. These will soak until probably um, Friday night, Friday afternoon, the boys will put this on. The smokehouse we've got is all computerised, it, it'll cook and smoke everything. It's got a probe thermometer in there. When the internal temperature gets to where we need it to be, it'll automatically shut everything down. Okay, so it's a set and forget set system. Um, the boys will put that on just before they leave at six o'clock on Friday. They'll come in at eight o'clock on um, Saturday morning. That'll all be cooked and smoked and ready to go. All right, so it comes out of there in the cool room and then we let it cool down until, we'll let these cool down until Tuesday and then the boys will be slicing that up and they've got the cabinet in on Tuesday. Um, there is different ways of smoking products. All right, what we do, we, we naturally smoke and if I could just get Kirsten to hop into the staff room and grab us a bag, a box of, bucket of wood chips, please. So there's a couple of different, a couple of different ways that you, you can you can get the smoky flavour in your bacon and ham, all right? Um, there's a product called liquid smoke. And the way that one works is basically in the smoke houses, in the, like our smoke house that we've got over here, in the walls on the, on the extremities and the walls down here and on that side there, there's elements in there, okay? And they have steam spray, spray uh, they have water sprayed onto there and that's how it cooks, okay? In the bottom part of the smokehouse, there's a, a, a drawer, okay? And this is what we use. This is this is what we use to get naturally smoked bacon and ham. Now these are an organic chestnut wood chip that we get from down south. Okay, they're all um, they just come in like chips. And then we've got a uh, in our smokehouse. There's a, a big element that sits down the bottom. We fill that drawer up when it gets into the smoke cycle. And, the element gets engaged with electricity and that smoulders the, the wood chips and that gives you your smoky flavour. The liquid smoke is basically just all chemicals that they use when they cook them and you, you find it a lot in the, in the bigger factories um, where they've got huge smokehouses, ten times as big as that, where they can hang a hundred hams in it at a time. And uh, they, they spray the liquid smoke basically out of a shower head on the outside of the hands, and that's how they get a consistent colour and, um, and flavour and all that through the whole lot of them at the same time. We don't use that obviously because it's full of chemicals, you know. When we say naturally smoked, we burn the, the wood chips and naturally make the smoke. So, yeah, a couple of different ways it's done. Um, there's no right way or wrong way. There's ways that you're comfortable with doing it, and I'm a lot more comfortable by burning those and making smoke than spraying chemicals on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's that's pretty much it. So um, yeah, like, like I said, these legs are quite a fair bit smaller than what we'd normally use. Um, Christmas time, we're making between 600 and 700 hams in our little smokehouse there. Uh, I can fit 10 in at a time, so that's 70 cooks that we need to do to get them all done. Um, Part of the reason why I don't like Christmas. Very um, busy. Yeah, it's with this. With what happens with the smokehouse is, as it's going through each cycle and that sort of thing, and it, you know, I can estimate how long it's going to take to cook those ten hams, and then I zoom in our security camera that we got up there down on our control panel, and I'll set my alarm through the middle of the night and estimate. Okay, it's four o'clock or two o'clock in the morning. These things are going to be pretty close to cooked. And then I'll zoom my camera in and have a look at the, at the digital readout there to see what internal temperature my hams are. If they're done at, at a temperature of 68 degrees, I'll come down, take those off, put the next lot on. All right. Um, with our with our hams, we need to get the internal temperature, whether they're bone in or boneless, to 68 degrees. And with our bacon, we get it to 58 degrees. Do you have any um, finished products around that we might be able to show? I've got a boneless ham. Boneless ham. Awesome. Yeah. Boneless ham. Also, hello Ken Weaver, thank you very much for joining our stream. So that's a boneless ham. Now, you see written on that ham. 
Now, is this um, a naked product or is this a traditional? This is a traditional one. Traditional. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, the process in making the two is exactly the same in that we still need to pump them, okay, and then we still need to cure them and we need to, need to cook and smoke them. The difference being the brine that we use, okay. This is quite time consuming to get our ratios right for salt and water to, to the rosemary. If we put too much rosemary in, the flavour overpowers everything. If we don't put enough rosemary in, we'll lose the product, it'll go off, okay. Um, if we put too much salt, it'll be too salty. If we don't put enough salt, it'll, it'll go off. This is the other option that we have, okay. Now this is called a cure. It's also called saltpeter, and it's also made from sodium nitrate. Okay. Now, the easy, easiest way, like my, my grandfather explained to me how they used to do this. He was a butcher. He explained to me this when I was 14, when I was a first year apprentice. He said, I'll show you how we used to make our brine when we were made ham, bacon, corned beef, whatever. And I thought to myself at the stage, why do, why do I need to know this? Because I can buy this packet of cure, dissolve it, tip it into salt water, and I've got the same thing. Yeah. All right. But it's as we now know, it's not the same thing because this is this is preservatives and colour enhancers. Yeah. Okay. That's natural. Yeah. All right. Now, as people have become more conscious of where their products are from and what's happened to them from when they've been a live animal walking around to when they're in a consumable state. People are becoming and doing a lot more research and want to get rid of preservative 250. Yeah. Okay. So something like this you would never use. We, 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 we still do this. Okay. We still do this. Okay. Right. When, when we first started doing the nitrate free hands, I thought I'd probably sell one nitrate free ham for every five of what we call our traditional hams. Right. Because unfortunately, preservatives and, and mass production have now become what we call conventional. Right, yeah. You know, it's my way of thinking that's crazy. Conventional yeah. is how a more natural way of doing it. Yeah. Okay, but we're, we're in an industrialized world. Okay, so it's a high turnover, get it in, get it out, you know, quick. So this is, this is what we now unfortunately call conventional. Um, so what we do when we make this one up, um, we'll make the salt water there and get the, sal the salinity correct that we need it at, and then we need to dissolve this in a bucket of water and add it to that. Right. All right? And that's how we do what we call our traditional range. All right, so if people see a difference in color between the nitrate free and the traditional, it's because it's got the preservative in it. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, because the traditional people got, keeps um, it pink. naturally think that bacons and everything like that are naturally really pink, but that's because of the nitrate, isn't it? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yep. And if I just read these, if I just read these, um, this warning out to you guys, I don't know, I'll hold it up so you can you can see it. Um, and it says, warning, toxic if swallowed. Right. I mean, doesn't that ring an alarm bell? Yeah. Okay. Um, contact with combustible material may cause fire. <laughs> um, uh, if you if you feel unwell, contact the first aid first aid directions. If you feel unwell, contact the doctor or poisons information centre. <laughs> Excellent. This is our conventional world. That's why everyone's used to this having. Is, this is what we're living in. Yeah. You know. And um, it's, it's so scary. And I mean, just to think of how you're telling the story about your your granddad, like how how easy it is to do that. And yep. You know, it's so natural going back to basics. Yeah, yep. this is what we've become accustomed to, something that's complex. And yeah, yeah. And this is what we call conventional. This yeah. Is, this is this is the run of the mill. This this is something special now. Whereas years ago it was, it was the other way around. That was all they had. Yeah. They didn't have this. You know? Um, and yes, and Heather just said nitrate free bacon is quite plain in colour from my experience, is that correct? So that's basically what we just touched on before about yeah. the nitrates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Uh, people, people need to be do a little bit of research too when they are doing nitro, when they are purchasing or looking at purchasing nitro-free products. Um, there is quite a few places around doing what they're claiming as a nitrate-free product now. Mm. It's coming out of factories and they're using other preservatives that just aren't a nitrate. Yeah. Okay, so... I noticed they use the term um, uh, like less nitrate or no added nitrates yeah. or so, but if yeah. you actually do read the ingredients, they've obviously got them in it. They're well, just uh, marketing... Or, just or not like necessarily nitrates, other preservatives in yeah. there. You know, something that doesn't fall under the nitrate family. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's some guys using celery seed extract and celery seed extract actually increases nitrates. Yeah. Yeah. So we stick to this because we know what it is. Um, we get great results with it. It's what, what my grandfather taught me. Uh, and as I said, I thought I'd never use it. Yeah. You know, and, and now our nitrate free products outsell our traditional range five or six to one. Yeah, wow. So, you know, we'll stick to what we're doing. Yeah. And, and, and Keep offering that that uh, as chemical free option as we can. Mm. You know, yeah. Wonderful. So, yep. And there's the traditional. Yeah. So that that's what that that's what this hand will look like once it's boned out. Uh, it'll be a little bit smaller. That one. That's by the looks of that, it's probably off around about a 40, 40 to forty three kilo pit. Um, but you know that that does look quite swollen up. But obviously during cooking, as with any product. Once you cook it and that sort of thing, you do lose weight. Yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Before and after. <laughs> Wonderful. So, um, so for anyone that does have any questions that they may not have thought of during this live stream, don't forget to leave it in the comments section, and we'll get back to you on that one. Yeah. Or, or jump onto our website and flick us an email from there. Yeah. If you. If you got something that you'd like to ask that you're not comfortable for everyone to, to know what it is um, yeah I'll certainly get back to you as soon as I can oh, we've got Damo Berryman watching hi Damo long time no speak <laughs> got a, a great crowd joining us today cool alrighty and um, for anyone that would like to see any of our previous videos like I said do jump onto our YouTube account which is the naked butcher um, so we do have a lot of stuff that we've done previously I'll just get, get Gary in the shot because he's looking a whole lot better than me <laughs> um, so yeah just jump onto our YouTube channel which is the naked butcher um, and we do actually uh, on our blog posts on our website we do actually have an entire article that is on nitrates and everything so like what we've just discussed but in a lot more detail and it has a lot of the um, the health facts and, and benefits behind it. So yeah, jump onto our website and do take a look at that if you are interested. Cool. That's it. Awesome. Thanks guys. Thanks guys. See Enjoy ya. Your day. Bye.